Welcome to a Monday edition of Beyond the Arc. I'm John Gonzalez alongside our NBA insider, Bill Ryder, and Ashley Nicole Moss in studio. And Bill is playing hurt today. What, you got a cold? What's happening over there? Uh, I believe the diagnosis is I'm allergic to the end of regular season NBA games. That That's, yeah, I've got, I don't know if I got like, a, I don't know what it is, John. It has not been, it, I just miss hoops. It, I did not feel great, but I'm here. Let's talk some hoops. I'm ready. There is WNBA basketball on. That's been pretty good so True. far. If that's something Angel you Reese and Caitlin Clark get into, yeah, balling. fellow yeah. Iowan, is that how you is that yeah. the terminology? It's the only reason I'm still moving. If there's no <laughs> WNBA, I would I wouldn't have made it. That's what got me out of bed. There is WNBA. There's also summer league, and we're going to get into that in uh, a notable name from summer league later in the show. Paul George tells his side of why he broke up with the Clippers. Kevin Durant addresses draft night trade rumors. Ant Edwards says he's the man for Team USA, and DeMar DeRozan finally finds a home. But first, as I mentioned, Summer League is underway, and Bronny James made his professional debut on Saturday. I had post-game coverage of this on uh, HQ. Not a lot to report here, gang. Uh, the California Classic is underway. With They played the Sacramento Kings in it. He went two for nine for four points. He had a layup and then a 16-footer from the left elbow, Bill, where he put the ball behind his back one time, and hit a jumper against a defender who was like four feet away and like Twitter and all these push notifications lost their minds. Uh, what did you guys, it was really frankly pretty ridiculous. What'd you guys make of his debut? You want me to go first? Bill, you want to go first? You go yeah. first, Bill. I think there's a few things to report here. Yeah, you go, you go first. You want I'll, me to I'll go first? Like myself, help us. Um, yeah, look, start us off. I'm not somebody who does summer league overreactions. I remember when Wemby had that one bad game at summer league, everybody was calling him a bust and like, oh my God, did the Spurs make a mistake? And summer league is what summer league is meant for. And that's for developing young talent rookies and hopefully getting them prepared for training camp, which then hopefully gets them prepared for the regular season. I try not to get too high or too low. Um, but look, we're also talking about a player who, and we've said this on the podcast, the, the reports are out there, who for all intents and purposes was not NBA ready. So it should not be a surprise that he's not NBA ready in his first debut. Now, I don't think that's a knock just to Bronny James. I think there are some other guys. Um, Dalton Connect, for one, has not had a good showing at Summer League so far. There's some other guys who are also struggling, but Summer League is what it's for. It's meant, I'm sorry, Summer League is a developmental league. It's a developmental time of year. But again, we shouldn't get too high on our expectations with Bronny because, again, he's not, quote, unquote, NBA ready. So I'm really concerned or I'm surprised and I'm confused by what people expected. Did they expect him to go out there and be LeBron James? I'm just, I'm not quite sure what the expectation was. So that's my take. So I, you are right. I mean, you cannot draw any actual conclusions from Summer League, for better or worse. There are plenty of people who have played very poorly in their debuts and gone on to great careers, and the reverse has certainly been true. And, and Ash, I was at that Wemby game in Vegas last year, and I remember sitting amongst people, media members who should have known better, who were overreacting in, in real time. I, I will say, I think there's two things that you can kind of take away here from, from Bronny's debut, and I'm with you both. There's no glaring headline written in stone that is forever. But you can make assessments sometimes about just the physicality of players, right? Guys will tell you, former players will tell you, that when players show up for the first time at practice, they will claim that they've often known whether that guy, just from a physical athleticism perspective, belonged in the NBA or not. And I don't want to overreact too much to Bronny, but remember when we talked when I saw him in Chicago at the Combine, I said he looked small? I thought he looked small against that King squad, too. And, and by the way, that King squad was but the B team. But he is small, I mean, the, relatively speaking. He, Vlad, I mean, right. he's bigger than me, but no, he is. he's small, you know? No, he it, and it's a problem. I, I like I don't mind him missing some of his jump yeah. shots. He'll work on that. There was a, and again, it's one game, but there was a, a, a physicality issue, getting pushed around by guys, looking like he wasn't the right size. Now, maybe that's just something that comes with time, and he'll sort of learn to adapt to his body and the fact he's playing against, and he will be playing against bigger faster, stronger guys, right? It's the it's going to be the NBA. The other thing that really struck me, and I suppose this, this always would have been true, is I'm used to watching really good players, Wemby included, struggle in debuts or struggle in summer league moments. And, and you watch it and you sort of know it's going to be okay, probably eventually, especially with Wemby. My worry is that this was just a, a showcase of how it's going to feel to watch Bronny James going forward. I, I know we've talked about this a ton, and I'm not drawing actual conclusions from the game, but there's a world where he's not good enough. I hope we don't get there. 
But there's a world where he doesn't succeed, where that four-year deal and the three years guaranteed is, is a joke, where the name is a burden on his back. And maybe that doesn't happen, but if it, if it, if it does, it's going to look like that debut did against the Kings, only the games are going to count and the excuses are going to go away. I'm not, gonna, I'm not drawing any conclusions, but physically it made me worried, and it just reminded me what is at stake if it doesn't work out for him when we get past Summer League and he's playing in NBA games. Because he is, his name is, it is James on his back. He is LeBron's kid. And I, I know this is obvious, but it just struck me, man, I hope this dude makes it. Because if he doesn't, the haters and the ridicule and the awfulness on social media is going to be vicious in three months or three years or, or whenever it is. The physicality really is the thing. That's the thing to do the takeaway on. I mean, his, he had a couple of open shots that didn't fall. That's fine. I, I wasn't really concerned about that. And there, and there were other moments that he actually, you know, he, he had some moments that weren't bad. I mean, he had a steal and then he got out in transition and made a nice pass on the break for a layup. You could see that he knows the game. There were moments when he was boxing out on, on uh, plays where I was, okay, that's an advanced understanding of an ex making the extra pass. But the physicality was really the thing because as Ashley and, and Bill, both of you mentioned, he looks small because he is small. And there was a moment where he was guarding a kid from the Kings whose name is Adonis Arms, which is just an amazing name. And he looks exactly like a guy named Adonis Arms should look, big kid, physical and he bullied the hell out of Bronny and Bronny got blown off the ball and I was like oh no and this is just a guy who was playing G League basketball last year we haven't even gotten to the real games against the real players yet so but that is a real concern he's not going to get any taller he does need to get stronger and and figure out a way to deal with the physicality well that was my thing when it comes to the physicality obviously in height but he, there's nothing you can do about that but in strength I mean we've seen and I'm not comparing him to this player I'm just using that as an example it's the first one on top of my head remember when Giannis got into Lee how small he was and then over time as he grew into his body and as he started to hit the weight room and things like that how much stronger he got and I mean the list goes on and on we're gonna see that with Wemby too a lot of people were concerned is he too frail is he too thin to be in the NBA is he gonna be able to deal with the physicality obviously his height makes it a little bit of an easier transition but when we talk Talk about Bronny, he's what, 20 years old, 19 years old, and obviously men are still growing into their bodies at that age. They're not remotely close to what they look like when they're 25, 30 years old. So you're going to see him mature physically. You're going to see his body change over the course of his time in the NBA. So I don't know if it's the physicality in terms of just what you can see with the naked eye or if it's more of a mindset in the way that he approaches the game, the physicality like that. But I wouldn't be too high or too low on his physicality or lack thereof because he's still a teenager. Like, I think we forget how young these, some of these guys are and everyone's body is different. So is every other guy that got drafted in this draft. But not every I mean, other guy that. had a big body and big NBA ready body when they got into the draft though, Bill. No, I'm just saying I hear you, but other players are going to get to catch up to that as well and, and maybe true. look a little more advanced than, than Bronny. But I'm rooting for him. Like I, yeah, I the, hope all the good things happen. The uh, the other thing is like some of the – you're right, Ash. People do grow into their bodies. KD famously too. I mean, a lot of these guys are super skinny when they come in. The difference is I think that there's like a pretty big talent gap there. But like Bill, I am rooting for Bronny. Uh, it would be nice if he doesn't – you know, go splat here. He didn't play in yesterday's game, by the way. He had a knee issue, but he is expected to play on Wednesday. Uh, one person who was very excited about him playing on Saturday was his dad, LeBron. We'll hear from him after we take a quick break. You're watching Beyond the Arc on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to Beyond the Arc. You're watching us on CBS Sports Network. We're also a podcast. You can find us wherever you get your favorite shows. Please download, subscribe, and leave a review. We're talking about Bronny James uh, to start the show. Bronny had previously and pretty famously said it was never his dream to play with his very famous father, LeBron James. You know That's who was pretty excited about it, though? I had no idea. Yeah, it's shocking, right? <laughs> Nobody's heard that what? before. Uh, as yeah, it turns know. out, and this will sh this will surprise you guys, LeBron has actually given it some thought. He was asked about it uh, while Team USA camp got underway this weekend. Here's what he had to say. It's a dream come true um, um, for me um, to see my son, to be able to um, you know, be in the NBA alone. And it's always been a dream of his um, and for us to be a side by side. It's a 
lot of words of loss to be honest. I don't know, man, the kid has worked so hard to get back to this point. Um, just so much has happened over the last year with him to have this happen less than a year from his incident to be um, with our friends and our family. When they announced his name, it was um, something that was super surreal and it's kind of still too much. We still, all our family, we still don't even have enough words to explain the feeling that we had. Bron, speak it to the mic, my man. Audio speak it to the a mic. little muddled there. <laughs> Sounded like he was maybe underwater or something, but a very uh, busy and I would say Bill successful off season so far. Well, not off season because he's about to go to the Olympics, but uh, post regular season, post po uh, playoffs for LeBron so far, his kid gets drafted. He's going to play with him. He's off to the Olympics. And oh, by the way, he did end up signing slightly less than the max. Uh, we were talking about him taking a two-year deal for $104 million and whether or not he would take a slight discount in order to keep the Lakers under the second apron. He did. Here's what he took. This is a very specific number, $101.355 million, which makes me feel like that's the least amount that he could go in 100%. order to keep them under the second apron. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, how do we feel about LeBron's summer so far? I mean, look, it. I'm gonna let me start with a really what's gonna sound like a very unkind take on LeBron, but it just hit me. Can he stop talking about Bronny? Like I understand he loves his son. I get it. I don't think it does the optics any good. Actually, I don't know if you guys saw. He also did a did a conversation on a podcast or somewhere where he based about how Bronny doesn't care what other people think and he's worked so hard to get here. What I think is that he got everything that he wanted. He got his hand picked coach. He got his son drafted. For all the reasons we've talked about, I would love if, if for a little bit LeBron just let his poor kid speak for himself and speak for himself in terms of how he plays because I like LeBron and I don't really know Bronny, but I, I'm rooting for him. And every time LeBron starts talking about Bronny and all the things he's earned and how he's worked so hard, how he's so humble and his great life experience, I just want to be his PR guy screaming, stop talking, like, just don't add fodder to this. It's a it's a mediocre offseason that continues, right? We don't know if the coach is any good. I don't think any of us think this Lakers team is particularly strong or impressive, but they've got Bron back, and that's what they needed to do. They didn't add any any big names. He's going to go off to the Olympics, and I'm sure win, win gold. So it's the story that we expected. LeBron got everything that he wanted. He values the things that he values. He took a little bit less money, so they're not in that second apron. But – I don't feel any differently when you actually look at this basketball team about the Lakers being a legit contender or even being a top six team, right? Even being good enough to get out of the play in than I did when the season ended and we were looking forward to, to next Lakers season. Yeah, I mean, I um I don't really know what I'm reacting to. <laughs> like father proud of his kid. We got that. We know he's proud of Bronny. We know how much he wanted this. He's been talking about this since Bronny was in high school. He's been talking about this since Bronny went to USC. He's been talking about this since Bronny declared for the draft. I mean, we get it. He wants to play with his kid. He's now playing with his kid. This doesn't move the needle, like Bill said, for the Lakers and for what I think LeBron's ultimate goal is, and that is to go ahead and win another ring. I honestly believe that that window has come and gone for the Los Angeles Lakers given and this has no this is no knock to who LeBron is and the talent he possesses because I think that we can be all in agreement and say that LeBron at 39 years old is doing things still to this day that we have never seen done before at the level in which he's doing it for the length of time which he has done it and that in itself is just absolutely phenomenal with that said we're still talking about a player who wants to win. For all intents and purposes, he presents himself as somebody who's not just playing this for fun, not just playing this for the money. He wants the, the accolades. He wants to hoist the trophies. He wants to flash the rings. The Lakers have not done anything to go ahead and obtain those goals. So if we're just talking about, you know, making history with a father-son duo and filling seats and, and, you know, constantly being in the media, which they already are, Okay, mission accomplished. If we're talking about winning and winning in the Western Conference that gets deeper and more stacked and younger every single year, the Lakers have failed tremendously at that goal. So, I mean, congrats on getting what you wanted in terms of the family side. We love to see that, but that's not going to change anything and ultimately when we're talking about winning games. He not only got what all that that he wanted, he also got a 15% trade kicker. So really like this whole thing was orchestrated the way that he wanted it to. Yeah, he took slightly less than the max to get them under that second apron, but this is what LeBron wanted. And so if they don't win this 
coming season. And then a lot of that is going to be on him. It was going to be on him anyway, but in terms of team building, like we've seen, Bill's mentioned this before, GM LeBron does not have a really glorified history. Le-GM. It hasn't gone well for him in the past. Yeah, Lay GM hasn't been maybe the best decision maker in the past, but I, I am of two minds on this though, because on the one hand, I'm with you guys that maybe they haven't gotten better. We'll see the jury's out obviously on Dalton Connect. They hope that he can be a rotation piece. Aside from like the top tier talent in the Western Conference, that like after the four spot, five through 10 is kind of a mixed bag. Like it wouldn't surprise me if the Lakers end up in the play in, and it wouldn't surprise me if somehow they get out of the play in and end up in that five six. They're not a playoff team, though. It's, I'll tell you that. Much. I think, well, no, I that's think what I'm saying. Warriors, it wouldn't yeah. surprise me if they are. No, absolutely the, not. They're no way a playoff no, team. I don't think, yeah. One through six. I think the no Warriors way. improved. I think the Warriors are better. They, I think the they have the fifth best Martin odds to win the West. Yeah, but I mean. And the Cavs like, have better the, odds the to win a championship than the Knicks do. That doesn't make it right, John. Okay. Yeah, but that's science. <laughs> that's true. Oh, yeah. Can't make your science. I, I mean, like, give uh, me, Here you go. You see, you see the odds here, Bill. Yeah, give me give me Memphis, I think, over them. I, I think the Warriors got better in a way the Lakers did not. I know some of those auditions feel like they're in the margins and the Buddy Heald sit on the bench the entire time in Philly was kind of weird. And am I crazy to think the Rockets can make a much bigger jump than than other people think they can? Maybe you're right, John. I just think everything has to break correctly and several teams that are that the Lakers are not better than have to underperform. Yeah. I mean, obviously that graphic the we're, we were talking a- that graphics says Eastern Conference, but we're actually talking about the Western Conference. Just want to make that clear. But I, I, I don't think that whenever you have a LeBron James led team, I think there's always a chance. And just because of everything he's accomplished, is that still true? I still think it's true. I think for everything yeah. that he's accomplished, everything he is as a player, I still think you give them an edge because of that. But when we're talking about the playoffs. I really am willing to stand and be almost 100% sure that this is a play-in team at best, and I would be very, very surprised if they were able to creep into that six. I just don't think they're that good. If we would have had this conversation last year, sure. I would. I, I think that they were – I just don't think that they've moved the needle enough in comparison to the other teams in their conference who have made a lot of moves. I would be very surprised if this was a playoff team next season. Given everything that LeBron is, I just don't see it. Top four, I think, is pretty well locked in. OKC, Wolves, Mavs, and Nugs, right? After that, it's really Memphis. a gr- I mean, the Clips, who are the Clips? I like Memphis a lot. I like the Pelicans. You know, the, the Kings go, and yeah. we're going to talk about Dallas. DeMar DeRozan Did later on. Dallas? The Warriors, as you mentioned. You yeah, Dallas I said they're, they're locked into the top four. But the five through ten, put them in a mixer, pick one out. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, and that includes the Lakers, who, by the way, do have two guys who made all NBA last year and one guy who was first team all defense. I don't know. It just wouldn't surprise me. Um, I know it would surprise the two of you. I, I, sure. I understand. It would. Uh, we're we're going to take, <laughs> we're going to take a quick break. And then uh, on the other side, Paul George had some very interesting things to say on his podcast about how and why he ended up leaving Los Angeles for Philadelphia. We'll hear from him on the other side. Ashley's already shaking her head. This is Beyond the Arc on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to a Monday edition of Beyond the Arc. John Ashley and Bill hanging out here. All right, so biggest move in free agency was Paul George leaving the Clippers, becoming the newest Sixer, gets a four-year max deal. We had on this show discussed, hey, you know, the longer this thing goes on in LA, the more it feels like maybe Paul George might be leaving the Clippers. Well, on his podcast, which is called Podcast P, Paul George was asked about it and kind of explained and walked (laughs) us through his side of how he said as he came to leave the Clippers. Here it is. What was the negotiations like with the Clippers to let you know that, hey, I'm leaving y'all and I'm going to Philly? Just to put it out there, like, I never wanted to leave L.A. L.A. is home. This is where I wanted to finish at. I wanted to work as hard as possible to win one in L.A. Like, that was the goal, to be here and be committed to L.A. As it played out, though, like, the first initial deal was, I thought, kind of disrespectful, mm-hmm. right? And again, no 
in all of this, no hard feelings. So the first initial deal was like two years, 60. So I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, that's crazy, bro. That's, <laughs> that's, crazy. that's great. That's crazy. crazy. That's crazy. If I might echo those gentlemen, two years for 60 is crazy. Uh, there's a lot to unpack from that. The clip Wait, went on John, for a while. Before you before you summarize this, I just want to let CBS know if you want to disrespect me with two years, $60 million, please feel free. Go ahead, John. I'm, I'm open to the okay, disrespect. But, uh, <laughs> I, I think we're all open to that kind of disrespect. Also, Ashley, I'm sure you noticed that he was wearing number eight and a little homage to Kobe Bryant, who never played for the Sixers, but grew up in the area. But later on in, in Podcast P's podcast, Podcast P performance, he explains that he then asked for the Kawhi deal, which was widely reported three for 150. But Bill, then he wanted the no trade clause tacked on, which I guess was a deal breaker. And then his final ask was, okay, well, if I'm not going to get that, I'm just going to go get four for 212, which is ultimately what he ended up taking with the Sixers. Uh, start where you want, but do you believe him when he says that they came in initially at two for 60? So look, I actually am not upset. Look, I don't think there's actual insults that exist in the negotiation at the beginning. That's why you have an agent, and that's why NBA players pay those agents 5 to 6%. I think the insult at the end. So they lowball at the beginning, whatever, fine, start of a conversation. So maybe maybe that's true. Don't care. Don't think it's disrespectful. I think that if he's telling the truth in the clip we didn't show, that he, Paul George, said, give me Kawhi's deal, but give me a no-trade clause so I know that I will finish my career here, and they turn that down. Because if they turn that down, why not go full max? Then one of, so there's, that's what he said. There's one of two things. It's either organizational malpractice or Paul George is lying. Or, and I don't think this is true because I know his agent. His agent lied to Paul, right? Maybe Paul's in all the meetings. There's an agent. Aaron Mintz is the, is the go-between at CAA. So either Paul George and his camp are lying or it's organizational malpractice. And at first, I actually didn't believe Paul George when I read it, guys. But having seen it... I think I believe him, which is to say, what are you doing, Clippers? Just, you've, you're already all in. You're already restricted. They just paid James Harden a bunch of money that's not going to ra raise this the bar at all. Yeah, I, I believe Paul George, I think. And they should have given him three years and $150 million in a no-trade clause and tried to roll it back with he and Kawhi for three more years. Crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's... Definitely insane how this whole situation unfolded. And obviously, two years, $60 million is not a lot for Paul George. It is a lot for me. Just want to reiterate that. Um, but it just, it's insane, right? Because we keep talking about this Clippers team. And up until Paul George signing with the Sixers, we were having this conversation. Like, you've invested so much, specifically in the duo of Kawhi and Paul George. You have this arena with the billion and one bathrooms. You're putting so much stock into revamping this Clippers organization that it's insane to not see it through in totality. And I understand that it hasn't unfolded and developed the way that Clippers fans had hoped, the organization had hoped for one reason or another. If it was not Paul George being injured, it was Kawhi being injured, them both being injured at the same time. It's been a very ugly and counterproductive era so far, but there's still, I feel like, when you have those guys and they're healthy, and that's the biggest factor, and now you bring in James Harden, I still feel like there was some light at the end of the tunnel that you owe just the investment of what you put into this team to try to see it through. The fact that they didn't do that and the fact that they let him walk for nothing is probably, for me, the biggest thing, and it just shows that you can have all the money in the world when you're an organization. It doesn't mean you're competent at actually running the organization. I have no idea what the Clippers are doing, how you can go ahead and be strong-armed of like for all intents and purposes, because if you remember when Kawhi joined the Clippers, him and PG were a package deal. I don't understand how you can break that package deal at this stage of the game, give James Harden all this money, who has shown you time and time again he's unreliable, let Paul George walk for absolutely nothing. Now James Harden becomes your second option, which, if you were paying attention in Philly, is not a good idea. I have absolutely no idea what's going on in L.A., but it's bad. They failed miserably. And let me add, John, just real quick. I think it's worth noting they were, right, they were hamstrung, so they should have paid him. This is also now the, one of the worst trades in NBA history. Everything they gave up for, for Paul George. And the minute you let him walk out the door, all those first-round picks, Shea Gilgis Alexander, it's, there's so much invested in terms of what they gave away and what they what they can and can't do in the next few years anyway. I don't – John, if you have a guess, I'd love to hear it. I don't understand the reasoning in L.A. if Paul George is telling the truth 
to not just if the sticking point is the no trade clause, just to not give them the no trade clause. Yeah, if the sticking tra- point was the no trade clause, I'm with you. It just feels and sounds like they were never on the same page because uh, also in that podcast, he said that he thought that, he, he, you know, he told them, okay, well, if we're not going to resign, I'm open to other things that are out there. And he thought that the Golden State Warriors trade was pretty much done and that he was going to get shipped out to the Warriors. And then the, the Clippers decided, and, and from the Warriors camp, there were reports that they had presented the Clippers with a menu of options and that the Clippers just disengaged and said, no, we're just going to lose him for nothing, which is really, truly wild. So they end up losing him for nothing. He goes to the Sixers. He's he's wearing Kobe's number now. He's going to team up with Joel Embiid and Maxi. But I wanted to run something by you guys because there was some reporting about what happened that night. Apparently, the, the meeting where they flew everybody out to meet Paul George in L.A. included two billionaire owners. Dr. J was there, Elton Brand, Daryl Morey. The, the meeting happened very late at night, L.A. time. And they're in Paul George's house here. Uh, Paul George is wearing an Allen Iverson shirt, which is very cool. Uh, as you can see there, he evidently made Dr. J and two billionaires take off their shoes Good. in his house. And I want to run that. <laughs> yeah, Ash, well, you go here. What do well, you think? OK, this is the rules in my mom's house, too. Don't come into this house with shoes that have been in the outside world tracking all that dirt and outsideness inside this house with my clean <laughs> floors and all of that. I absolutely agree with that. Take your shoes off. If you don't have socks on, that's too bad. You're going to have to walk around barefoot. I'm the same way. My mom is the same way. Don't track the outside inside. That's defeating the purpose. If I wanted to be outside, we would have had the meeting outside or I live outside. I don't. This is a clean space, a clean environment. Keep the outside outside and leave the inside inside. Good for you, Paul George. Make them take their yeah, shoes off. your mom off. gets it. The outside is gross. All the th- I, by the way, added bonus. I I personally I don't have the money or the style to keep up with the shoe game of billionaires, but the sock game it looks very just level. I mean, those guys are just wearing some random socks from Target. So I, yeah, Watch them be like fourteen hundred dollar like Ferragamo socks when you probably, wouldn't even know it. Probably are. <laughs> no, I wouldn't know. No, I, are you I a, know are you are, a actually. socks and are you a shoes inside the house person, John? I'm sort of indifferent. I just thought it was a real flex for them to fly all the way across the country, give them $212 million, and oh, by the way, take your shoes off. Yeah, take your shoes. You let people from the outside have outdoor shoes inside your house? Shoes off in our house, too. Shoes off. Yeah, I mean, if I have get, if I we take our shoes off, but if there are guests coming over, I'm not going to demand Mm-mm. that they take their shoes off, especially not guests who are ferrying two hundred and twelve million dollars across the country on my behalf. Uh, but he good for you, Paul George. Take their shirts right. off, John, and they would have done it. Like, no shirts. <laughs> yeah, that would not have been a picture I would like to see, though. I would have not wanted to see that picture. <laughs> that that is that is definitely true and also very funny. All right, quick break, and then on the other side, we just got all kinds. Everybody has something to say over the the weekend uh, on the other side kd had something to say about the draft night trade rumors he was not happy about that and then anthony edwards decided who's the man on team usa i'll give you one guess who he landed on we'll do that next this is beyond the arc on cbs sports network Welcome back to Beyond the Arc on CBS Sports Network. You can also find us on YouTube. Our page is at Beyond the Arc CBS. Please subscribe, hit the like button, leave a comment. Uh, Team USA, a lot of stuff happening with Team USA. We heard from LeBron earlier. KD was also talking uh, to Yahoo Sports during camp and addressing the draft night trade rumors, which he was not at all pleased about. It's hard not to hear what they got to say about you. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, because especially then you could just make up lies. Like, everybody going to believe you. Like, you could just press the KD want to leave button anytime you want some attention. Like, yes, it's a for sure a button. (laughs) What else is going to get people going around this time besides, oh, the, 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 the journey, man, is leaving again. That storyline going to always hit. You know, the people, you know what I'm saying? That's why they send you the alerts on ESPN on your phone. Oh, KD's thinking about leaving. That's how big that story is, which is whack. Because <laughs> I'm talking to Phoenix every day, all, you know, since the season ended. Like, our our GMs, coaches, everybody, we've been locked in. So it's like to say here, somebody say, well, Phoenix doesn't. Phoenix wants to get out of the KD sweeps. I'm like sitting there like, where is this coming from? I, listen. I, I want I I to flag a couple things here. I want to flag Do a you? couple things here, Ash. He 
he says that what else is going to get people going? Uh, evidently, the only game in town during the offseason is the KD game. But then he's a Hall of Famer who Bingo. also calls himself a journeyman. I'm confused by KD. KD loves him to get in his feelings. Go ahead. What do you think about this, Ash? Well, I, I agree with what he's, pieces of what he said. One of the things that stood out to me was the same sentiments that I had when the trade talks were even, you know, percolating to begin with, is that there's already a narrative about Kevin Durant that he chases rings because he's, and when you actually dive in, but when you dive into the nitty gritty of what transpired, right, he was in OKC for a very long time. It's not like he was there for two years and dipped out because it didn't work out. He spent, what, six years in OKC and got close, but didn't get close enough. Now, again, the way he went to the Warriors after that whole situation with OKC left a bitter taste in people's mouths, yes. Won two championships in Golden State, then goes to Brooklyn, it doesn't work out. But we're talking about this narrative that Kevin Durant runs from the grind. I think it's unfair because he eats, sleeps, breathes basketball. Nobody can say he's not dedicated to his sport, to his craft. And I think that him leaving OKC after six years, if I'm right on that number, I could be off by a year or two, to go to the Warriors, yes, the way it happened wasn't the greatest but if he went to a different team and was able to win with that team, I don't know if people would have the same feelings about it. I just think it's because the Warriors had just beaten OKC and it kind of looked like you were going to a team that was going to give you a guaranteed championship. But I don't, I don't make, I don't push that. That's not a scarlet letter for me when it comes to Kevin Durant, his legacy, what he means to the game. But when we talk about the Sun situation, I had the same ideology. I felt like if Kevin Durant, whether he's traded, leaves on his own accord or whatnot, the narrative is going to be, oh, here's Kevin Durant again, going to greener pastures, trying to cheat the system. And I feel him completely when he says that was in the back of his mind as well, too, because people don't care if it was a trade or how he got there. All they're going to see is, well, another team for Kevin Durant because he couldn't make it on his own in Phoenix. I understand why he, he had those sentiments because those were mine as well. I'm glad that it didn't happen because that would have been Armageddon on the NBA discourse yes. when it came to you know, the Kevin yet. Durant. Or, I will not put I, that in the universe, my, John. <laughs> I'm not saying that. I, I'm with... By the way, the proper context of this is, of course, people are talking about Durant leaving. The Suns have two choices, be disasters yes, yes, or trade yes. Kevin Durant. And so yes. the tail is wagging the dog here for Durant. No one's saying Durant is the one who is suddenly chasing the rings in this case. It's they're going to have to move Durant eventually. They will say they it, though. The they're going to say he failed yeah, in Phoenix, one, but, just like he failed in Brooklyn. But my Well, he did fail, and he will have failed. But my main reaction, I think, is John's main reaction which is, Kevin, that, that Kevin Durant button is not as big as you think. We're in the, what are we, in the fourth block here? We're talking on the fourth block. Kevin Durant leaving doesn't change, doesn't move the needle the way that it used to, Kevin, KD, because you haven't actually been successful at the places you've gone. The other day, I, I was out true. with my wife and kids. Oh, I think it is. Not at the level of a Bronny or LeBron. When the he other left, day, when he left Brooklyn, that was, that was oh, everywhere. Didn't work. Didn't work. I think, I think it's lost some of its appeal. It's a boy who cries wolf. Have you ever been to dinner and you're listening to somebody talk but you can't see them? I was at dinner. There was a lady behind me talking about how hard it was to be this attractive and people always hitting on her. It was just people don't know how difficult it was to be beautiful and it's so hard to be. This isn't something I can relate to. So I finally turn around and look at her and not to be a jerk because I'm what a four. She was a five. And it was just like it's, people can be delusional. <laughs> Kevin Durant is having this conversation. Man, they want to talk about me and I move. No, you don't. He's like he's a he's a, a B level needle mover now. No, he's a third, he's no, interested. yes, no, yes. People I can't give that to you. What, whether whether he moves it's the needle, true. whether he moves the needle or not, and obviously you guys are in a disagreement on that. I think the point for me was that he's conf <laughs> he's making up an argument that nobody was talking about KD being moved because people thought that KD wanted out. People were talking about KD being moved because the Suns should think about moving KD because it's one of the only levers available no. to them for team building because they're deep into that second apron and they're not going to move Devin Booker and they can't yeah. move Bradley Beal because he has a no trade clause. That's why people are talking about it. John, you were talking about that as a rational basketball fan, but let's not pretend that there is a plethora of just common sense existing when we talk about basketball as a whole. There are a lot of he people. He does chase rings. But they, 
Him, it's but okay. he didn't chase a ring when he went to Phoenix. The situation in Brooklyn was a dead end. It was a dead uh, end. There I, was nothing left for him to do no. there. There was nothing left he, for him to do. James Harden was gone. Kyrie wanted out. Thought, there was nothing left for him to do there. It was a dead end. Would you rather his end his career in a dead end? Look at Brooklyn now. Right. Here's the reality. Here's the reality. He cuts and he runs. But you know what? So does every person in a career. I'm from Iowa. I don't live in Iowa anymore. I don't live in Little Rock. I don't live in Chicago. I don't, right? Like, I, as my career has allowed me to move to different cities that are awesome, I have done that. Do I cut and run? Yeah. Like, you chase the things in your career that you want. You're entitled to that. But you you can't you can't pretend you haven't done it. Just be like, yeah, of course no, I chase rings. I'm a, grown, I'm a grown man. I'm Kevin Durant. I want to go where I want to go. Like, this idea that he's been a loyalist to one team his whole career, I don't... What does he want me to say that he's Cal Ripken? But there's that he's Kobe no, Bryant? there's no. Okay, but there's no reward for loyalty in basketball because you people people have to okay. be on people have to be on one side of this argument or another. And I'm not just I'm not talking about you specifically. I just mean in general. People chastise Damian Lillard for not getting out of Portland earlier than he did. Every season that it's Portland true. fell short, Dame, you gotta leave. Dame, you gotta leave. And Dame's like, look, I, I wanna play, I wanna make this situation work. He waited too long, couldn't go to Miami. The organization he was so loyal to said, we're not sending you where you wanna go, we're gonna send you where we want you to go. Ended up in Milwaukee. He's miserable, at least in this first season. It had not turned out the way he wanted to. He missed his family, he missed his friends. There's no reward for being loyal. I have no issue with Kevin Durant knowing he's in a dead-end situation, especially at this stage in his career, and saying, it's not working, I want out, let's go somewhere else. LeBron has done it, but LeBron has seen his contracts through, but LeBron goes to different teams he, every couple of years. What's the difference? He's won everywhere. Oh, what my God. Well, so, But it's a team sport. Kevin Durant can't win in Phoenix by himself. Phoenix is not equipped to win. Brooklyn was Literally a disaster. Can. You can't you, – that's not a Kevin Which Durant Which is why – People started talking about the Suns, maybe thinking about unplugging him because they can't win without him. They can't win with him either. Uh, one more break. And then on the other side, we're going to hear from yet another Team USA member. Ant Edwards thinks he's the man. That's coming up. This is Beyond the Arc on CBS Sports Network. Ant Edwards does not lack for confidence. He was asked during Team USA media availability, who's the main guy on Team USA? Here's what he had to say. I'm still the number one option. Yeah, I mean, y'all might look at it differently. I don't look at it no differently. Yeah, I just go out there and be myself, um, shoot my shots, uh, play defense, and, you know, they got to fit in and play around me. That's how I feel. Yeah. I love him. <laughs> I love him so much. I love him too. Who's the number one option? It's, it's ridiculous, this guy. but <laughs> don't thumbs. I love him. I love him. I love the confidence. He's not the number one option, but I love the confidence. Um, this is so what sad. makes Anthony Edwards endearing. This is what, in my opinion, makes him the face of the league because not only is he talented when it comes to his craft, but he's charismatic. He's a little bit delusional. He is arrogant. He is the best combination of all of those things. And that's what you want in the face of the league. I love Anthony Edwards. Not the number one option, but still number one in our hearts. <laughs> Not even a starter on this team, but everything Ash said, I'm, I'm, I'm down for it. Yeah, he, he I love, I, and by the way, if you're going to prove people like us wrong and we're going to look back and say, oh my God, Ant actually was the guy with a team with these stars, you have to believe it first. I, I love it. I love his brashness. As you guys know, I was an early adopter on the Wolves and on Ant Edwards. I, I do love him for content, but imagine the stones that it takes to be on a team this good that's up there with the Dream Team and the Redeem Team, at least on paper in terms of talent, where you have LeBron James and Steph and KD and Embiid and Tatum and Kawhi, and I'm, I'm going on and on and on. And you look at that and you go, you know who's awesome? Me. <laughs> like that's just this guy. that's really really amazing <laughs> but it's part of it's part of what makes ant ant right because he doesn't shy away from those kinds of things quickly before we go on to demar derozan who is not on team usa who do we think starts alongside i, I think lebron kd and steph uh are probably yeah, locked in as starters probably a uh mb maybe anthony davis at center and then you need one more looks like maybe tatum or Kawhi. more than likely i think it's going to be tatum so so I'm going in over AD, though it's close. Here's my hot take. I may have been influenced by our producer, but he, he turned me around on this. If you're going to put Drew Holiday on the team, you put him on the team to guard the opposing team's best scorer, guard or wing. Put Drew Holiday out there and let him do all the hard work. Let him be that guy. So I'm going yep. the big three, 
Drew Holiday, and Embiid slightly over Anthony Davis. I like Drew Holiday there. I, I was talking to Avery Johnson about that, and because uh, there were some people who were like, "Why is Drew Holiday on the team?" That's why I, I think he's gonna yeah. he's gonna be your best wing defender, point of attack uh, defender. Uh, we got to wrap up with Demar Derozan. The final big name in free agency ends up in a sign and trade with the Kings. Three years, seventy-six million dollars, average annual value just north of twenty-five million. Sounds pretty good, but that is less than Nick Claxton and Isaiah Hartenstein got. Uh, Three-team trade reroutes Harrison Barnes to the Spurs, and then Chris Duarte, two seconds and cash go to the Bulls. Ash, quickly, what do we think about this fit for the Kings? Like it, don't love it, think it's going to be solid. I think when De'Aaron Fox goes to the bench, when he misses games, because on average he misses around 15 to 20, I believe, it's going to go ahead and not feel as heavy for the Kings. However, they run a motion offense, and that's not really the type of player that DeMar is. Also, their defense is not great. They have a very porous defense. I don't think he helps them in that aspect at all. He's not a defensive player by any means. So, yeah, another weapon in terms of in the clutch, fourth quarter, he's phenomenal. Don't know if it moves the needle for the Kings in the way that they want, you know, to move the needle for this team, but it's a solid pickup. I'll say that much. Hate it for the Kings. Wish Chicago wasn't the cheapest organization in American sports and the Spurs. I think it's a master class in how, how to build a team and, and, and get assets. Now, Sam Quinn wrote a story on this at the website, cbsports.com, and is much better than I can do or give you now. But, yeah, DeRozan's great late in games, and he does give you clutch scoring. I think he was clutch player of the year two years ago and second or third this, this past time. But high usage rate, he's going to stop the ball. De'Aaron Fox already does that. John, I, I, I don't like – it feels like a panic move for a Sacramento team that, that didn't have its core guys at, partic at particularly old age and didn't need to do this. I, I actually do not like it for Sacramento. Yeah, and I understand why they made the panic move because they look around at the Western Conference and go, okay, he's the best available player. And he did. He has averaged 20 points for 11 straight season, and, and he's played at least 60 games during that span. But as Ashley mentioned, not a good three-point shooter, sub-30% for his career. And as Bill noted, also really ball-dependent. According to Second Spectrum, Garen Fox handled the ball for 473 minutes last year that's 10th in the nba derozan was 17th so like yeah if he needs the ball that much and he's not shooting threes like how much might he gum up the works and like they were middle of the pack defensively 14th last year but i, I think they get worse with demar derozan it's just a bummer i mean at least demar gets out at least he gets out of uh, out of chicago and goes to sacramento but i don't know what that's do you guys think that they fall right probably still playing yeah probably still playing i hope i'm wrong I hope Ash is right, and because it is, it is scoring at the end of games, which they need in the playoffs. But yeah. I, I think it's play for me. We'll see how it works. Uh, that's going to do it for us today. We're going to be back here, right here on CBS Sports Network on Wednesday. We're off tomorrow, much deserved off day for everybody. But we'll be we'll be back here on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. But for now, for our NBA insider Bill Ryder, for Ashley Nicole Moss, I'm John Gonzalez. We thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you on Wednesday.